God helps those who help themselves. Wow. Uh, we're in a series right now. Uh, it's called Book Smart, and basically a subtitle to that would be, that's not in the book. I remember as a kid, there was this commercial, and there would be an elderly woman, probably somebody about my age, <clears throat> and she's laying on the floor, and she would say, help! Oh, you saw the same commercial. Okay. And, and so we're, we see a stark contrast. Lord helps those who help themselves and help. I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, which of those is true? Huh. Well, we're going to look at that today. Uh, that's not in the Bible, by the way. Here's some other things that we've all been taught to believe that aren't in the Bible. Like, um, you ready? How many wise men were there? Well, Larry Paulus is a ventriloquist. He threw his voice right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say. We all think that there's three because there were three gifts that are mentioned, but it doesn't say how many. How did Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem? Doesn't say. Well, yeah, the Hallmark thing, she's on the donkey and everything. Doesn't say. Right? Here's one. Did Adam and Eve have navels? You figure that one out, you should write a book, okay? It doesn't say there are things that we've been taught to believe, like cleanliness is next to, not in there, okay? Not in there. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes from like Shakespeare or Aesop's fables or, or a whole plethora of sources that really aren't scriptural, but we've been taught to believe. And, and I think my mom is the source of a lot of them. Like an idle mind is the, the devil's workshop. And I spent a lot of time with an idle mind. Maybe you didn't, but, but I did. Today's thing, the, t the focus we're going to look at is that the Lord helps those that help themselves. That's from an Aesop's fable. There's a guy that, uh, he's got a wagon, and the wagon gets stuck in the mud, and so the more he works, the deeper in the wagon gets down. You know, it's, it's up to the tongue, and then it's, you know, like up to the, the base of the wagon, and he finally, in desperation, calls out, Hercules, come and help me. And so Hercules shows up, and Hercules says to him, in essence, um, get off your rear end and push. He says, put your shoulder to the wheel, man. And that's where the expression, the origin of the expression comes from. The gods help them who help themselves. Now, we've all been taught that that is a biblical mindset, a, a biblical worldview. And, and you can find in Scripture there's a, a whole lot of uh, dialogue about not being lazy. And a lot of that's found in, in the book of Proverbs. I, I remember my dad would, on a regular basis, say to me when I was you know, a teenager, and there's something happens when people are teenagers, they, they require a lot of sleep, especially when school's out. You got any of those people at your house or in your life? And my dad would, would wake me up, you know, after, a, well, you know, I'd stay up until 3 o'clock, you know, watching, you know, TV. Like, there was a thing out of Indianapolis called, Sammy Terry, and it was the scary movies, and I remember watching that, okay, you know, and it's three o'clock in the morning, and then you go to bed, and my dad would come in, and he'd go, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and hence poverty is upon a man, and he would have all these, you know, like, witticisms that do come out of Scripture, that God does want us not to be lazy, he wants us to be diligent and disciplined, but he also wants us to be acknowledging that we are absolutely, utterly dependent upon him. He is our source. And so God helps them that help themselves is not a scriptural worldview. Ben Franklin took that expression in 19, 1757 in Poor Richard's Almanac. Now, Franklin was a deist. A deist is somebody that believes basically God is like this uh, absentee landlord. He's not personally involved in the condition of, of human affairs and interactions. He, he's, he's like this, uh, he made a watch. 
he winds it up and then he steps back to see what happens. And, and a lot of our founding fathers were deists. They didn't believe in a personal God who interacted with humanity. Does that sound compatible with a, a Christian worldview? I don't think so. The Lord helps them who help themselves. Hmm. Not biblical, not scriptural, not anchored on the heart and the nature of this good God who is actively present in the human condition. In 2017, the Barna Group, they do research and data polling. They, they found that 52% of people who considered themselves born-again Christians believed that the expression, the Lord helps them, who's helped themselves is in Scripture. That's problematic. We tend to be ignorant of God's Word. And so we we kind of look at God's word as uh, almost the, the, well, you go to the Chinese restaurant and they give you that little almond cookie and there's a little piece of slip of paper inside. You're not supposed to eat that. Just telling you. I know from firsthand experience. Anyway, um, like the shrimp tail, I'm not supposed to eat that either. Uh, and, and there's this little piece of, of information in there. And, and, you know, you pick your lottery numbers off of that. There's, there's an awesome thing to do too, Okay. But there's this, this piece of, of information that is supposed to enlighten you and make your life better because I, I found this in my fortune cookie. It's okay. okay. <laughs> you, you hear that behind you and you thought maybe somebody fell over not in a not good way. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay, hon. Uh, <laughs> I just was making sure that you know, Lenny was still with me here. Okay. <laughs> So, I think a big lie in our culture, especially in, in Western versions of Christianity that we've been taught to believe is that, the, the, that God somehow does have a, a, a predisposition to being absent in our life and expecting us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That the Lord helps those that help themselves. And I found in my life, and I'm sure you found in your own life, that when you've applied that kind of maxim to your life, you can get out of your lane and you can get into God's lane and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you're doing things in inappropriate ways. Wait, but, but we're no exception. We have our forefathers that did the same thing. Remember Abraham and Sarah before they're Abraham and Sarah, they're Abe and Sarai. And God makes this promise to them that they're going to be the parents of a great nation. And they're like, well, God's not getting around to this great nation stuff on their timetable, so they take matters into their own hands. You guys remember that, don't you? And, and the, the fallout from that, we still feel to this day. There's the child of the promise, and there's the child of human ingenuity. So that's kind of counter to the Lord helps those that help themselves. I want to drill down into this further with you, that how did that come into our life? Well, I think some of it is, is our Western cultural kind of thing of we've all been taught to be hardworking and diligent people. And here's, here's the thing that we've bought into is I'm a good, decent person. I mow my yard, I pay my taxes, I pick up my trash, and, and uh, I don't ask anybody for help. Because if I ask for help, that means I've been drinking the weak sauce. That means there's a deficiency in me. I'm, I'm a weakling. If I have to ask for help, that means that I'm deficient. Now, remember, Jesus was with the guys in the upper room and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples and Peter jumps up and he's like, whoa, dude, that ain't happening. I, no, you are not washing my feet. Do, do you remember that? Why, why did Peter make that kind of a statement? What drove that kind of a statement to become a, an articulated pushback to Jesus? Self-sufficiency. Okay. You guys all had toddlers. You guys were all toddlers at one time in your life. And there was a thing that you probably said and you've experienced from, I do it myself. I do it myself. No. 
Okay? And do you think that this holy God looks at us sometimes and he thinks, oh my goodness, they're an 80-year-old toddler. I do it myself. I got this. You see, that's the biggest tripping thing that we all face is that we believe we're the answer to our own hardship and dilemma. I'm just going to work faster and jump higher and I'm just going to just put in more time and it's all going to work out because I got this. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. We've been called into relationship with a holy God and with his holy people. We tend to think that, well, other people, if you need that, that's great. Larry, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm glad that you've said, you, but, you know, it's okay. I, I could come and help you, but I'm not going to let somebody come and help me. I remember Tammy and I went to a marriage retreat. It was a fascinating thing. It was, it was probably one of the wake-up calls to God's call on my life. And in this marriage retreat, people, Tammy and I sat together, and there was a small group. There was a group, eight other people, and they all said things to us about what they saw in our marriage. As, as words of encouragement, of, of, what they called it strength bombardment. You guys are each other's best friend. You, you're, you're there for each other in, in regardless of the circumstances and that, those kind of things. Now, I could sit on the outside of that circle and I could tell everybody how awesome I think they are as an individual and as they are as a couple till the cows came home. And I'm sure you're wired up that same way. I could bless other people. I could speak a blessing into other people very easily because it's part of my worldview. I, one of my spiritual gifts is the gift of encouragement. I, I can see God's working in your life and you may not see it. But I, I'm like, God says that you are wonderfully and uniquely created. And Okay, I can do that. I can do that till the cows come home. But to sit there on the other side, the receiving side of somebody else's observation, oh, no, 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 no. I don't need to sit here. There's other people that need encouraged, other people that need blessed. I'm good. I got me. I can do this all by myself. So that keeps us from the grace and the love and the encouragement of the body and of the one who calls us his own. What happens in that mindset is that I tend to see myself as my own savior. You, you hear what I just said there. You, I see myself as my own savior. I got this. And I start making the doxology about myself. Praise Rob from whom all things flow. Praise Rob because he's the all that all the time. And I do so as a sense of self-idolatry. I'm the center of my own work. I'm my own savior. The Lord helps those that help themselves. Plays into that. I don't know if you've been to a funeral where they play Frank Sinatra's version of Paul Anka's song, I Did It My Way. You, you ever been there? Yeah. Paul Anka wrote that song in, in kind of a, a parody of the me generation because he had been around the, the Rat Pack and he said they thought they were all that. And so I Did It My Way was a little bit of a parody of he wrote it with Frank Sinatra in mind. I can't hit that note or I would sing part of it. <laughs> I did it my way. It's 
Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Now, why would the psalmist say, I lift my eyes to the hills? What's up on the hills? The pagan deities. That's where the shrines, that's where the, the, the Asher poles and everything. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift my eyes to the hills. Maybe my help is here. This is going to be the source of the relief in my life. I, I lift my eyes to the hills. And, and in my version there, there's a question mark. Is that the source of my help? I don't think so. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. And so the major point is, first of all, is that God is able. God is able to do what concerns me the most. God is able to understand the peril that I'm in or am going to soon be facing. He is able to bring to the condition of my heart and life his kingdom response to the brokenness. He is able. Mary, when she becomes notified by the angel that she's pregnant in Luke chapter 1, verse 27, she says, with God, all things are possible. Well, what's all things mean? It means all things. You mean there's something that God can't do? There was an old, okay, you guys maybe heard this like in a, in a psych class when you were in high school or whatever. Can God do anything? You ready? Can God do anything? Well, yes or no. So the, we're going to do the real thing here. Can God do anything? Yeah, okay. Can God make a rock so big that God can't move it? Well, come on. If God can do anything, can God make a rock so big that God can't move it? Well, that means he can't do anything then. You don't you know, here we're at that. I spent a lot of money learning this at seminary. That is contrary to God's nature to do anything to test himself. We can test him in regard to our giving, but God will not test himself. And so it's outside of God's nature to do something that would be contrary to his nature. And since sometimes you just have to press the mystery button. I guess God can do anything. Well, if he can do anything. So, God is able God is able to do anything vastly superior to whatever I could come up with, whatever I could dream, whatever I could fathom. Now, what keeps me from believing that God is able? Well, either I don't trust God because I've got trust issues. You guys ever seen the thing with a trust fall? You know what I'm talking about? You have somebody standing and you know, they're, you're going to catch them. And I saw this on, I think it might have been on uh, The Office. They were doing the trust fall and the person fell forward instead of backwards. We got other issues going on here. Do you trust God and his ability to interact with your life and bring a kingdom response to the brokenness that's holding court over you? The other thing is, I think that sometimes we put our, our own agenda Kind of in, in a, in a pride-filled place, it's like, I, I just don't want to bother him. You know, I, I'm not going to bother God with that stuff because he's got other things he's worried about, you know? There's bigger things on God's mind. I got this one. I'll bring him the big stuff. That's called arrogant pride. If I don't think that God can do anything about the little things, 
why would I believe that he could do something about the Herculean things that I'm contending with? There's no big thing that is beyond God's purview and ability, and there's no little thing that he doesn't care. In fact, he says, and he's, you know, he's not had to work as hard for me right now, but he has the hairs on my head numbered. There's fewer there, and, and it's getting fewer and fewer. And Phil said, you know, Rob, you got a great comb over you and Jen Katie, buddy. Okay. <laughs> His eye is on the sparrow. If he cares about these little birds that are annoying, do you think he doesn't know about the stuff in your life that you just stubbed your toe or you just bounced a check or that you just got a bad report at the doctor's office or your kids are far from faith and they're living in the far country or that you are in the midst of a kind of a meltdown because the world's in a meltdown? He is able to deal with all the stuff. So God's able. Well, then what else do we need to know about? Not only is God able and he hears. In fact, the children of Israel, we know in the book of Exodus, they're in the midst of peril, in the midst of pain. They're in the midst of oppression in, in Egypt. And they had gone there with God's blessing and then bad things well, some 400 years later, they forgot who they were, whose they were, and where they were going. And, and bad things just continued to spiral out of control. And they were under oppression, and they began to tap back into their identity. And they cried out for help. You remember that? They cried out for help. And this absentee God says, hey, pfft, you know, you snooze, you lose. Card laid, the card played. It's on you, dude. No, that's not what it says at all. God heard their cry. God heard their cry. He was moved with compassion and he was moved to action. As they cried out to him, he raised up. He raised up someone to help them take the next right step out of bondage into freedom. So God is able. He hears the cries. In fact, in the New Testament, God knew that we were going to need help. He knew that we were going to need help. In fact, he says, okay, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm sending the helper. What do you think the helper does? He helps. His name's the Holy Spirit. And he sent the helper to help us. So that we wouldn't feel like we had all this on us. And I can't carry this anymore. I can't deal with this medical diagnosis. I can't deal with the fact that gas is out of control. I can't, feed, I can't deal with the fact that my relational world's in tatters. I can't, and he says, just been waiting for you to cry out on me. Because I got the helper right there, right now. Able to help you in what concerns you most. God is able. He hears our cries. And so we have to humble ourselves and ask for help to trust that he is able. It's not from a position of weakness, rather a position of awareness that we all need a helper. There's an old hymn that says, I need thee every hour, every hour. I need thee. That's paramount and fundamental to our understanding of who we are, whose we are, and what our kingdom mission is all about. God is able. The second thing you need to understand about the heart and the character of God is not only is he able, he's all powerful and can do, he is willing. He's willing. To be available to meet and minister to the need of your life. He's willing. He's not like, okay. I think sometimes we uh, approach God like he is this angry landlord and we're asking, or, or that professor, I don't know if this ever happened to any of you. I remember having to go see the professor. Could I have an extension on, on turning this paper? I got a little busy. Some things went on. Could I, could I get an extension? Well, yeah, it's going to 
And so, you know, you reluctantly go and approach God like he is the, the cosmic professor, and he's reluctantly, begrudgingly giving you an extension. You guys, as parents, when your kid says, can you help me? Especially when they get to be teenagers and they ask for help and you're like, oh, we still live in the same house. This is remarkable. They want me to be involved. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've been waiting for you to ask. And that's what I see that the character and the nature of God is that he's overjoyed. He's more than willing. He wants to be involved and invited in to the need of our life. He is willing. I think it's that joy that when we ask God for help, he gets overjoyed. That's just my contention. It's like, oh my goodness, you, you want me to help? I'm just delighted that you ask. You guys know that? Okay, in your life, when we go to the funeral home and we say, hey, is there anything I can do? Just let me know. You're not going to call me. You're not going to tell me that you need anything because you got it, right? Somebody's sick. They've gone into the hospital. They got surgery. You say, hey, just let me know. If there's anything you need, just let me know. And you go, thanks for saying it. That's all I needed because, see, we're pretty proud and we're pretty self-sufficient. I got this, Right? And when you're on the receiving end of the ask, okay, so I come to Lynn and say, hey, let me know if there's anything you need. And she says, Rob, this is goofy. Is there any way you could take my car to the car wash? Well, what do you think I'm going to say? Take your own car to the car wash. What? <laughs> Lazy bum. I'm not going to say that, am I? What am I going to say? What would you say? If she said, Rob, could you take the car to the car? You, give me the keys. You got it. Wouldn't you? You all would do that because that's who you are. So think about that's with our heavenly father. When we invite him into the brokenness and the need in our life, he is not only willing, but he is more than able, and he is filled with joy as we make the ask. God, I need help with this. I need help. And he will bring the help and the relief. It may come in unexpected forms, and in fact, in fact, it may come in a form where you're like, okay, I can accept help from anybody but that person. And that's who he's going to bring across the door because there's bigger things going on. God is able and God is willing. We just have to know his heart and trust his plan and, and know that he is present in the midst of the pain and his power availed to the need in my life brings relief that will surprise and delight me. And it all starts with me being able to acknowledge that I've got a need. I can't do it by myself. Help. I've fallen and I can't get up. God is willing. We just have to call upon him. And he hears the cry of our heart and he brings his power and presence to the midst of our pain if we will but trust him. Let's pray.